All right, and welcome to another episode of Podcast on Fifth Ave. I'm Taylor Haas. You're Danny Shirey. Last time we dropped an episode, it was it was right after you and I got back from Nashville. The day and we before. couldn't talk. <laughs> uh, and then it was, it was the day before free agency. So we were talking about, you know, what happens and all. We have a whole lot to talk about since. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about all the signings that they've made over the last week. Re-signings to players they've let go. And then we also had development camp to cover. So uh, definitely a full slate today. But and start off with some of the new signings uh, they've made. And, and the biggest one is Ryan Graves. Um, I, you know, they let Dumoulin go. Ryan Graves coming in automatically. That's a, that's an upgrade on D. I know you just wrote about Ryan Graves. If you want to talk about just what the Penguins are getting in Ryan Graves. Yeah, one of the things that Kyle Dubas mentioned when uh, at, at the end of the first day of free agency when he was talking about all the signings, one of the things that he mentioned regarding Graves was that over the past handful of seasons, he's consistently been um, deployed in a manner where he's going up against uh, the opposition's best players, whether it's their top lines or top power play units. So he's a guy like unquestionably, like you mentioned, that's going to be an upgrade over Brian Dumoulin. They're essentially going to usher him into that exact role where they're going to try and use him as their shutdown guy. Um, with that being said, I think expectations might be, need to be tempered a little bit because there's a difference between excelling against top competition in that kind of role and just getting by. And I think Graves is a little bit closer to just getting by, but there, there is still value in that. Like as we saw with Dumoulin last year, he, he wasn't even getting them by and it was literally crushing them. So there, there is value in having somebody that can just get you by. And I think there is a little bit of upside there, um, for improvement over over what he did specifically last season with the Devils, um, but he's six foot five, two twenty. He's not. He's definitely not as physical as you would think. Uh, just looking at his size, um, but but he's really strong. He's not easy to move around the net front, um, and and he holds his own in the corners as well. One thing I, I think people will be surprised by as well is that he he can contribute offensively a little bit too. He he really likes to shoot the puck. Earlier in his career, he had a real issue where he would just fire anything and everything, and he would incessantly rail shots into shin pads. He has cut down on that a little bit um, after he went to the Devils the past two seasons. Um, but he likes to shoot the puck, and he's he's not – you know, the fastest skater in the world because of how big he is, but he, he moves around pretty well for his size and he utilizes that to activate onto the rush. He's not, you know, someone that's like head manning the rush or anything a la Eric Carlson or, or Chris Letang, but he has been pretty effective at joining the rush as a trailer. And, and you know, after a, a pass or two, after his team crosses into the zone, he'll sneak into the slot and, and get a good shot off. So he'll contribute in that way. I just don't think he's going to excel, you know, in, in any one area. But again, you look, Penguins aren't, he, he's not on the books for some outrageous cap hit, right? And with with the, the salary cap expected to go up by several million here over the next couple seasons, and then you look at what the Penguins would have had to pay for alternatives. Uh, you know, one alternative that I mentioned before free agency started was potentially going out and making a trade for Noah Hannafin. But in that scenario, they not only would have had to spend futures assets to bring Hannafin in for one more season, but after he becomes a, a free agent at the end of next season, he was due for a hefty raise. It probably would have pushed over $6 million. So you compare that to just giving Graves six years at, at, the, at, at under $5 million, I think is, is pretty good value there. Um, so it, it's a good signing for the Penguins. I, I don't think he's going to necessarily crush it, but the, I, th I think the fit is really good and, and the value there made a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, 4.5 million for, for a top pairing D. I mean, he's going to be able to play with Latang is what it, what it looks like now. That's a uh, great value. I don't know. I still think the, I mean, the defense is still not the defense is better. I still don't think it's the defense of a contender. You go into the season with a, what Smith or Joseph and with Root as your third pairing, I think, if they're going to look to improve the D further, um, I think one of those guys is one of the ones to take out of the lineup. Uh, but that, yeah, that's the only move they made for the for the D. Uh, a lot of forwards. We so we can talk about like the guys who have left from the bottom six and the guys they have brought in. Um, so going out, Archibald Benino, if you can count him, um, barely saw him, uh, and Ryan Paling from the bottom six. Jason Zucker's gone too, but it seems like. Um, 
Riley Smith is more going to be his replacement. But yeah, Archibald, Paling, kind of Benino going out on the bottom six. Coming in, uh, Noel Chari, Lars Eller, Matt Nieto. Uh, it, it's hard to say. I, I, I don't, it's hard to say if the defense. I mean, if the if the bottom six is getting better. Um, like are they? Because right now they're. Pro- the roster they have, they're over the cap. If you look at like a projected roster, that there's still moves to be made. Dubis, he made it sound like they're just gonna send some of these guys down to Wilkesbury. Um, I don't know. To say if like did the bottom six get better, it's hard to say without knowing. Like, are they gonna have the cap flexibility to sit Jeff Carter because he's not getting sent down? He can't. Right. Um, if they can somehow get to a point where they have the cap flexibility to put Jeff Carter in the press box, then, like, for sure. But it's hard to say without knowing what further moves are coming. Just what are your thoughts on the bottom six? Yeah, I – in a in a pure personnel standpoint, I think the bottom six is moderately better. Like, yes, last season's bottom six couldn't produce, but last season's bottom six also wasn't controlling play at all. The fourth line was okay in a just very low of low event, like decent defensively. Um, kind of manner but the third line they weren't controlling play and they and they weren't contributing offensively whatsoever the bottom six as it appears right now looks like it's going to be you know I I would say it's going to be considerably better defensively but I I just don't know where the goals are coming at all last year is as maddening as Kasperi Kapanen was and even even Brock in when Brock McGinn when he went through that what 27 game stretch without putting up a point well there was a point earlier in the season where McGinn was scoring goals at will off the rush and Kapanen again as frustrating as he was he was still putting up points at a decent rate so all the acquisitions they brought in they're at least going to be probably below that threshold I, I don't expect them to meet that threshold at all so you just start looking around and you go if if the objective here was to take any sort of pressure off the top six and to, you know, if, if they don't score on any given night, where else are the goals going to come? And I'm just not convinced at this point in time that enough has been done to kind of lessen that burden on the top of the lineup. Yeah. I feel like you're losing some of just the energy too. And you know, like what, when Paling was healthy, I mean, his, his speed alone. And then Archibald, Archibald, he wasn't a, big hitter but like his rate of hits same with paling and then uh with like drawing penalties too archibald his mm-hmm. rate of penalties drawn was like towards the top of the league he was like top five the entire league i'm gonna say um for most of the year so you're you're losing uh those elements too there's um you know you have you want to talk about like finishing you have alex nylander i but i don't see where he fits in now with all the pieces they've made um they, the, the pieces they've brought in i don't cap wise roster wise i don't see where nylander fits yeah no so b- before before free agency opened i i had him penciled in onto the yeah. the right wing of the third line there but now you look at the personnel they have and and you already knew before that that like nylander's playing style doesn't really cater to what Mike Sullivan's looking for out of a bottom six winger, but at the same time, they need some youth. And again, I know Nealander's not some sort of prospect or or youngster anymore. Um, but the the offensive potential and upside that he has, I figured they would try and lean on that a little bit to get some scoring and and get some value out of that league minimum contract. But now it's looking like in a best case scenario, if if they even do have the the cap flexibility to have him on the roster, he's kind of shaping up to be the thirteenth forward right now. Yeah. Uh, a couple of other, I mean, we're going to get into the goaltending in the next segment, the whole thing. But, I mean, they, they made a couple of, of depth signings, too. Uh, Unikop and then Ford, he was playing in – so these are – when I feel like whenever they announce these signings, all their replies, you're like, oh, my God, play in the parade. People <laughs> like <laughs> – but, like, you have to sign players for Wilkes-Barre, too. Unikop and then he was at the Providence Bruins last year. He's probably going to be down in Wilkes-Barre. Um, Ryan Shea, defenseman. Um, probably gonna be down in Wilkes-Barre. He's one from the Dallas organization. Uh, Mark Johnstown, this is his first uh, NHL contract. He's someone who uh, played in Newfoundland, the Toronto Marlies, kind of worked his way up um, from, I mean, a guy who was passed over, not an NHL contract, started out an East AHL deal, AHL deal now, he's, um, now he's signed. And then Redeems the Horner coming back. Redeems the Horner, you figure he's he's destined for, for Wilkes-Barre too. Obviously, uh, Dubas, big fan of Redeems the Horner because he traded for mm-hmm. him from Calgary and now he's signing him. Um, I don't 
thinking that none, 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 of those, none of those guys are starting on the NHL roster. Maybe they come up at some point during the year. But with those guys, the takeaway is that it seems like they're investing more into Wilkes-Barre this year. Because if Wilkes-Barre hasn't been good in a couple of years. But, and obviously the prospect pool is one of the weakest in the entire league. But that's not at all why, that's not all why Wilkes-Barre struggled the way they are. It seems like Pittsburgh the last couple of years has just not invested in the high quality depth pieces uh, for Wilkes-Barre. And that's, you know, signing, there are guys on like AHL contracts too that, you know, those kinds of vets. But then it's also the guys on NHL deals who you either kind of have to pay on a one way, which people don't know, people get confused. One way, all that means is when they get sent down, they get paid the same. So it's an investment financially, or if they're on a two-way and it gets paid differently, that they have a high age, they have a high age or salary too. You have to give the high quality, like older guys, like you know, late twenties, those kinds of deals, because otherwise they would just get a, they would sign somewhere like in Arizona, or it would be easier to crack the NHL team. So it's a financial investment. The Penguins really haven't been doing that the past couple of years. Now it seems like they're definitely committed to doing that. I expect Wilkes-Barre to be much better, looking at just the moves they've made. Um, and that's good for the prospects too. I mean, if you look at the competitive AHL teams, they, their rosters filled out with these kinds of guys. Uh, even Wilkes-Barre, like when they were making playoff runs, like 2013, when they went to the Eastern conference final, like their captain was like an older guy, like a Joey Mormita. And then you have like a Trevor Smith and Alex Grant and those kinds of guys. And then even the years after that, like Tom Kostopoulos when he was down there, like no one thought Tom Kostopoulos was coming up to Pittsburgh, but he was, you know, the captain in the first line center. So uh, these moves, I think, are, are big just for the for the organization. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah I, I think that lines up with the Tony Androkidis' report from earlier in the offseason when he was talking about, you know, Mike Sullivan and, and Fenway Sports Group when they were searching for a GM, quote unquote, president of hockey operations um, and Jurokin has put out a report that they, whoever was going to be hired for that new role, they were basically going to be demanded to make Wilkes-Barre highly competitive, right? Because, you know, it's, it's not necessarily about just making Wilkes-Barre a better team, but they, to your point, like you mentioned, it's about creating that winning environment. So as, as the Owen Pickerings are coming up and as the Braden Yeagers are coming up and playing for Wilkes-Barre, you don't want them showing up to some sort of tire fire. You want them to be in that winning environment and in, in the right um, locker room culture and everything like that. So it, it seems like they've taken a couple of uh, positive steps forward. Um, I, I don't know that you should necessarily plan the, the Calder Cup parade mm -hmm. yet, but uh, they, they should be considerably better than they were last year. For sure. Uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about the biggest signing the Penguins made on the opening day of the agency. Talk about the goaltending as a whole, so stay with us. All right, and we are back. The Penguins' number one concern going into free agency was their number one goaltender. And they addressed that by re-signing Tristan Jari to a five-year deal, carries a $5.375 million cap hit. Uh, there's a modified no-trade clause in there. I believe it's 12-team no-trade. Uh, I mean, you look at that. I heard a call, like, the first day for agency. You just at, so Tristan Jari is going to be the goaltender for the end of the Crosby, Malkin, Latang era. Um Three thoughts on the Jari signing? Because I know I was with you when it happened and we were both pretty shocked. Uh, dumbfounded would be a good good mm -hmm. word to use there. I mean, as, as, as the opening of free agency neared, I had a growing sense that Jari would probably be back. And even at the end of last season, before before the season even ended, I, you know, I warned people that, you know, Jari might because of his up and down season and the inconsistency and in dealing with the injuries, he might have postured himself, um, you know, to to get one of those buy low contracts. Right. Like a, I, I hate to use like the, the prove it deal or, or the show me deal or whatever, but it seemed like he was kind of tracking more toward that deal. Whereas if he had continued his performance from earlier in the season, that he might have been pricing himself out of the Penguins range. But to to end up at the point where you're committing to him for five years. Five years is insane to me. Like I, I get that, you know, the it, it 
probably didn't make sense to to spend any futures assets on someone like Soros or Hellebuck. Obviously, that didn't transpire or, or going out and getting a different goaltender. And as we've discussed a million times, the options on the free agent market weren't really any better than Jari. Um, but to to give him five years is just it's asinine to me. The, the cap hit five point three seven five million per season. He can be worth that, especially if he's playing well. He will be worth more than that. But I am not convinced in the slightest that he's going to make it through this contract. Oh, like injury wise, I don't that that would be my biggest concern, knowing what he dealt with last year. Um, it was not a hip issue. I'm not even sure where that came from, but it, it, it wasn't that. It's not a soft tissue thing. And it's something where like I don't I don't feel like my understanding, it's not something where like, oh, just an off season breast. It's not like it's not right. like a Jason Zucker core muscle where it's like he just needs a full off season to get healthy and then it'll it, that's it. I, 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 it doesn't sound like that's what Jari's dealing with. So I don't, I mean, Kyle Dubas didn't say anything in his, in his press conference that day that like Jari is totally healthy. Um, it wasn't anything like that. He's, he acknowledged the injuries and they just playing through injuries, but I don't know. I mean, the sense I got, or just how I look was looking at it is like, cause you know, this happened a couple hours into free agency. So Jari definitely heard from, I mean, he ha- there's the opportunity to hear from other teams. I wonder if maybe they were looking at other options maybe via trade. Cause like you said, the free agents really weren't anything. Like Freddie Anderson was one of the best free agents and he just ended up resigning a couple of the bigger UFA goals. They just resigned. Um, like Aiden Hill was going to be, he resigned. But anyway, um, maybe they would have liked to do so- uh, something via a trade. Then it wasn't, gonna they realized that wasn't gonna happen at least maybe it wasn't gonna happen fast and you don't want to lose Jari as your backup option if the trade's not gonna work out so I wonder if I but then again I I also thought that like okay so like they let Jari kind of test for agency for a couple hours with the injury thing you would I would have thought that you know he would have he would have gotten low offers from other teams and that kind of would have driven his price down here you get what I'm saying um, but so I wonder if other teams offered him deals similar to what the Penguins just gave him, and that kind of forced the Penguins' hand to give him five years over five million. Yeah, that's that's something I haven't really been able to wrap my head around yet because just sitting here thinking about it, you would have to imagine that Jari going and talking to other teams, like I I can't see another team that would have matched what the Penguins gave him whatsoever, especially with the uncertainty around his injury. Um, you know, you, you could make the argument that another team would have paid him that cap hit. Like, like I just said, he, he will be worth that cap hit if, if he's, you know, not incredibly inconsistent. And if, and if he is healthy, that that's not the concern here. You look at what the the senators gave Jonas Corposalo. They gave him uh, five years and, and 20 million, which is a, a, four million annual cap hit for a guy who was quantifiably one of the worst goalies in the league for five consecutive seasons to then have one good season. And you give, you give him a contract like that. That's insane. So then I see the Corpus Allo contract and I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe Jari was talking to other teams that would have at least matched what the Penguins were doing. But I, I like, who were they bidding against and who, who, and of those teams, who who would have done that? I just, it's it's very tough, very very tough to wrap my head around it, and especially looking at what Dubas did last offseason as general manager of the Maple Leafs. Yeah, he traded for Matt Murray, and that obviously backfired. But he also signed Ilya Samsonov to a, a one year one point eight million dollar contract, and Samsonov provided extreme value off that deal. So, and again, I, I know we've talked about the, the uh, alternative options via free agency weren't great, but I, I was just very surprised, especially with the way Dubas talked about goaltending at his introductory press conference, talking about how difficult it is to predict and project um, and just how volatile it is. That's why I was so surprised, especially what we we know about Jari's situation, that they went five years on his deal. Yeah, it, the trade options – weren't great. I mean, there definitely were some out there. It, Hellebuck, he would have been affordable this coming year. Beyond that, I, they wouldn't have been able to keep him. He's going to be like a $10 million goalie. Um, but I, but if you're looking at just a year ahead of you and that's all that matters, and maybe that would have been something that they could have done. Um, John Gibson, I, neither of us were 
high on that, especially his cap hit and what what it would have taken to have the Ducks retain salary and or a third team retain salary to make it work for the Penguins. Um, Saros is the one we talked about a lot just because it looked like the Predators were going to go into like a little bit of a like a mini rebuild but then looking at the moves they made to open free agency it was clear that that was not what they were doing they're going for it um and also came out that they were the goalie the predators were looking to shop was askarov which is the our whole theory was like okay you move on right. from saros now askarov's the top goalie prospect in the league you give him the time but yeah so it seemed like saros was never really gonna be an option uh, Swayman, I, he's he hasn't gone anywhere yet. He's an RFA. Um, the Bruins could trade his his rights. He's filed for arbitration, so that that complicates things too. So yeah, I mean the options weren't great. Um, in reality, this should have been addressed long before July first. Like not not even by Dubis, but Hextall was so loyal to Jari. Hextall was never going to move on from Jar, even if there were like in, is there even if there's internal pressure on Hextall, like leading up to the trade line trade deadline to like go out and get a goalie. Um, Hextall was never going to do that. Hextall honestly probably was going to give him five, six years. So I don't think no, the, 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 the contract the the contract that Jari got from everybody that you and I spoke to. This sounds like the contract that Hextall was prepared to give Jari. Yeah, I don't know. Hextall probably would have just given it to him a little sooner yeah. uh, and not, you know, looked at his other options. That's what, it, that's what, I, that's what, yeah, we, like you said, we got the sense that, that was going to happen. Uh, they, okay, other, other goaltending. Uh, so when they did that, it seemed like, okay, they're going to go into this season with Jari and Smith. And then it seemed like maybe not. Uh, they signed Alex Nedeljkovic uh, to 1.5. So just a year left at one. Eight, Nadelkovic is signed at one point five, and then when so we can talk about that, but then you know D- Dubis talked kind of shortly after the Nadelkovic signing, and he's like, "Yeah, we're still a goaltender short," acknowledging that Yo Blomquist is for sure coming to Wilkes-Barre next year from Finland. He's not going back, but he could have gone back. He's not. They also have Taylor Gauthier down there. He's like, "We're still a goaltender short," um, and I asked, like, "What?" What do you mean? Like, because I, I was under the impression that maybe they try to send DeSmith down um, or maybe try to move him. But no, they wanted another one. They want six goalies. And so they signed Magnus Helberg. So I don't know how this plays out if both Wilkes-Barre and Pittsburgh try to sign, try to carry three. Pittsburgh really doesn't have the luxury cap-wise to do that. Wilkes-Barre, maybe, maybe Taylor Gauthier goes down to Wheeling. He gets, it's not like a bad thing for a goalie to go down to the ECHL. It's not the same as like a skater, but I just don't understand. I don't know what happens with DeSmith or Nedeljkovic here, but Beth Helberg for sure, Blomquist for sure, definitely in Wilkes-Barre. Beyond that, what do you think? Yeah, I, the the signings definitely pointed to DeSmith being on, you know, kind of unstable territory right now. I just like – I know everybody's been saying it. You cannot, 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 if you're the Penguins, bring back the exact same goaltending tandem that has failed you in some capacity in each of the last three seasons. I agreed with that. However, it should have been Jari that went. Like I, I know we just, I, I know we just talked about this, but if you look at what Casey DeSmith makes, he's got one season left at a, I believe it's a one point eight million dollar yeah. cap hit. You look at what he makes and like, I, I get why people dislike him. I do. He's, he's inconsistent. He's a backup goalie. He can't shine when you need him in to be the starter over an extended period of time. But if you stack him up against every other backup across the league over the past two seasons, three seasons, his entire time with the Penguins, he is a considerably above average backup goalie, right? So then who are you going in and legitimately – improving over him who are, who are you going out and get that's going to be an actual improvement over him at that same rate okay well you look at Alex Nedeljkovic you look at his body of work in the NHL the the COVID season with Carolina he posted a 931 save percentage 
uh, saved 13.3 goals above expected, but it was just over 23 games. Then they opted to – I can't remember if they traded him to the Red Wings or if they just let him go and he signed with the Red Wings. But over the last two seasons in Detroit, he was terrible. In his first season there in 21-22, he had a 901 save percentage and allowed 11.5 goals above expected in 59 games. This past season, he only play, played in 15 games and because he stunk so bad, posting an 897 save percentage and allowing seven goals above expected. So if there's some idea here that Nedeljkovic is going to come in and, and take to Smith's job and maybe even and put some pressure on Jari, well, aside from 23 games that happened during the COVID year, there's nothing suggesting that's actually going to happen. Yeah, dismiss dismiss a fine backup to a real number one goalie, a true number one right. goalie who can play number one goalie minutes in that many games. But Jari, health wise, doesn't look like he. It just doesn't seem like he can be that. Jari needs a one B behind him, and Nedeljkovic and DeSmith are not one Bs. Um, yeah. So. I mean, I don't see what else they can do with the goaltending. This is going to be the goaltending. There's, the only kind of question is what happens between Nedeljkovic and the Smith. I mean, so like a couple of years ago when it was Murray and Jari um, and both Jari and the Smith lost their their waiver exempt status, they they were sneaking. They tried to sneak. They were, were going to try to sneak the Smith down on waivers and the thought at the time is like okay they're definitely going to lose him he ended up making it through I don't think that would happen this time if you try to sneak the Smith down through waivers uh, with now that he kind of has a little bit more of a body of work and if teams are looking for a backup and because he's so affordable I, I don't think you'd be able to sneak to Smith down anyway but then I also don't think that that it didn't sound like that was the plan because of the when they signed a Duckwich Dubas was like okay we need another goalie we, mm -hmm. we need to go out and get a sixth one. So I don't um, – that's going to be kind of the storyline at camp to see how that plays out. Because, yeah, like like I said, I don't think – you know, it's, they're going to be tied against the cap. They really don't have the luxury to be carrying three. And even if they did, is that what's best for DeSmith? Because how much would he actually be playing? And then when he would get in, would he be, even be that great? Um, I don't see the vision. I mean, the vision is is that they hedged their bets on Jari, one, being able to manage his injury, and two, cleaning up his, his on-ice in inconsistencies. We, we could make the argument that his inconsistencies are a result of those injuries, but you go back even earlier in his career, he, he's been extremely inconsistent, even considering that the goaltending position is volatile as volatile as all could be. Um, so they, they very clearly are just hedging their bets on Jari and expecting him to get the job done. And I, I really have my doubt. Again, it, it, if everything goes according to plan, they, they will be getting surplus value out of his annual cap hit. But that seems like a very, very uncertain proposition at this point in time. Yeah, it's just really the health thing. And when we talk about injuries, like I know we've everyone's like, well, you, you know, the the series when he was out against the Rangers, that's not his fault. I, we're not. I'm not. No. Anders Lee fell on his foot and it broke. There's nothing he could have done about that. It's 100% about what he dealt with last season and how it's not just like a one-off, like, oh, easy, you know, summer off, and then he comes back in space. Um, so that, would, that that's just my concern. But a uh, lot, to, lot to see there with how that plays out. We're going to take another break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about my favorite part of the year, prospect building. Uh, the Penguins, uh, the, the first day of free agency coincided with the first day of uh, the prospect development camp. De development camp, a little bit shorter this year, only three days, two days of practices and a scrimmage. And so to some people who don't know what really prospect development camp is, I know a lot of people looked at that roster and it was like, this, this is the prospect pool. It's not. Um, development camp is more so aimed towards the guys who don't really have the pro experience um so, like even the guys who they signed last year who played a full season in wilkesbury like we're not all these scratch we're not sent down like the jack st ivany they were not on that roster those guys that's what rookie camp is for in september when they have more of the junior guys and the european guys that's when the ahl guys come in and those are the guys who go and play the tournament in 
Buffalo. The lone exception on this roster is Sam Poulin, but that's because he really didn't play last season. This was more so just aimed at getting him more playing time to get back up to you know his form because he was away from the ice for so long. But anyway, so this 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 roster, it's more so the guy, it's the college guys, European guys, junior guys, and the guys who just barely played pro last year and maybe weren't a f- regular in Wilkes-Barre's lineup. So now we have the parameters. <laughs> who, are, uh, <laughs> who are some of the standouts for you? I mean, it's, it's hard because it's not like an evaluation camp. You can't really watch. Like, if a guy puts up like four goals in the scrimmage, it's like that's not really much. It doesn't really mean much, but it's more so watching for like their individual skills and right. you know, skating, stuff like that. So knowing that, who were some of the standouts for you? Yeah, the the one thing I I don't want to say it was the biggest thing I took away from development camp, but the, there is no doubt in my mind that Braden Yeager has become the top prospect in the organization. Um, yeah. The his shot is ad, as advertised. Um, I I wrote um, in in my column on the final day of development camp that like yes his his shot is lethal. It it looks great on video, but it's one of those shots that you can't truly appreciate its greatness until you see it in person. I mean he he is not a big guy and he's he's not overly heavy either. Like he he needs. And he's under Yeah, he's like one hundred sixty yeah. pounds. <laughs> Yeah, he he needs to put on some weight and and bulk up, but then you're watching him shoot, and it's not only just the zip that's on his shot and how how fast he releases it, how fast the puck comes off his blade, but it's got this heaviness to it too. Like It's jarringly heavy, especially when you look and see the body that's flinging that puck, right? It just doesn't make any sense. So um, that really stood out throughout camp, whether it was in the drills or in the the three-on-three tournament in the last day. Um, But one of the other things that I picked up on is that uh, you know, th- there was a lot of talk about how last season he kind of focused a little bit more on his playmaking. And, you know, that was, you know, obviously his, his assist total jumped up. Um, but I, I think there is some playmaking upside there just from the some of the passes he made and, and the way he was seeing the ice, making some of those little slippery passes. I really like that. And he, he's a better skater than I originally gave him credit for, too. I mean, he he was creating separation during that tournament like it was nothing. Nobody. Nobody could catch him. I think the only one that ever caught him when he was blazing up the right wing was uh, Owen Pickering, and that was really just because of his long stride and long stick that you could just reach out and, and kind of get him. So um, I thought Jaeger had a very, very good camp, and I left camp with no doubt in my mind that he's number one on the on their prospect list right now. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned Owen Pickering. He was who I was going to talk about. I, the strides he made, you more so didn't notice it until we were like – off the ice but he put on a lot of weight I mean because you look at him last year he was he said he weighed in he's what six foot four something like that he he was very skinny he weighed in at he said 175 last development camp and that's understandable because like you look at you know just 2019 he was five foot seven like he mm-hmm. shot up so like yeah his the, the rest of his body just catching up like weight weight wise to all that height he added and in no time. So yeah, he was super skinny. He's definitely more filled out now. He's he put on a lot of muscle. Um, he said he's right now he's like around like one ninety five ish, one ninety five ish. So he put on like twenty pounds. Um, Tom Kasapa said ten pounds of that alone was like since the season has ended. Uh, it sounds like so it, he's he's working fast. I mean he he it's not just like in the weight room the Penguins. Um, nutritionists and their staff have, have really been working with him on his diet uh he told me he's eating six meals a day plus shakes so he's eating constantly and it shows and it's it's good muscle it's good weight it's lean muscle because his skating has not been affected and that's something you know the the good skaters when they put on weight maybe you worry about but no but it's it's good muscle it's he's still lean but it's he's just stronger um and I mean, he's he's still like what their number two prospect. He's definitely their top yeah. defense prospect. But um, yeah, that's the most encouraging thing. So him, um, the NHL and the Canadian Junior Leagues have a transfer agreement. You can't play in the in the AHL until you're 20 years old. Just something aimed at because otherwise, all the top junior players would go to the AHL and you deplete the junior leagues, um, and then they wouldn't be able to produce the kind of content the the 
the high quality players that they're putting out now. Um, so it's either NHL or back to junior. Pickering's not quite ready for the NHL. Um, so he's definitely going to go back to junior. But as part of the rule, when his se- – so Swift Current Broncos, that's where he plays in the WHL. When his season's over, then he can go to Wilkes-Barre. If Wilkes-Barre is still playing, they should be playing. Um, so he did that this past season. Um, he came in there mm, – maybe like three weeks left, and he played in eight games – he didn't look that great uh, in his own end in a lot of those games. Um, he didn't put up points either. I mean, they had him in a top four um, role. He was quarterbacking one of the power play units. But I, I'm not concerned about, you know, how that how he looked there. That was more just about getting him the experience. And he talked about how valuable that experience was because um, he gets to play against grown men and he knows what he needs to work on. So, um yeah, we won't see Pickering and Wilkes-Barre to start, but maybe he comes at the end. I mean, Jaeger could do that too if Moose Jaw doesn't make mm-hmm. a run. Um, Swift Current, yeah, Swift Current might miss the playoffs. That's why Pickering was there as long as he was. But, uh, yeah, encouraging stuff from them. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was going to say, so my opinion, I, I don't necessarily disagree with anything you said about Pickering. I was just a little disappointed with the on ice portion of his development camp. And again, I know it's not it's not an evaluation camp and, you know, watching a guy do drills or how he performs in a three on three tournament has very, very little correlation to their their future outlook. But with that being said, knowing that the talent isn't great on that development camp roster and knowing that he is one of the top prospects in the organization, I was, I was a little disappointed that he didn't stand out more in a, in a positive manner. I mean, he, he stood out obviously just because of his size. Um, but looking past that, he, he kind of, at least to me, seemed like just another one of those run of the mill prospects. Again, you and I have talked a lot about how he's, he's grown a ton both vertically and now that he's putting on the weight um, over these past few years. So th- he was always going to be a little bit more of a, a longer project and maybe take a little bit more time to develop as he learned how to utilize his bo- his new larger body. Um, but from what I saw during camp, it just seems to me like he hasn't really figured out what kind of defenseman he wants to be right now, because it seems like he wants to be, an offensive kind of defenseman, but I don't think long term that he has the the puck control or the puck skills to be, you know, all that effective offensively, which points to him being more of a defensive kind of guy. But I didn't get the sense that defense was his focus at all right now during camp. And maybe that's just because he was trying to stand out and, and make things happen offensively, but that just wasn't happening. Um, the, he made one phenomenal pass in the in the final of the three on three tournament to send his team to overtime but aside from that i i was like wow this he every time he was under pressure it seemed like he was making a, a suboptimal play when he was under pressure uh i i will give him credit his, his long stride his long legs when he is under pressure and he actually decides to skate the puck himself when he has open ice he's able to create separation pretty easily because you know he takes two or three steps and then he's you know already gone from from the four check or whoever. So um, I, I don't want to sit here and say like, oh, he's going to bust or, or whatever it may be. I was just I was expecting a little more from him for throughout camp. Yeah, I don't I, It's hard because three days of camp, two days of practice. The first day, too, was like mostly skills work. Right. But like the scrimmage, well, the, the tournament, it's I even when it's not three and three, you like can't put anything into that. Like I mentioned, um before we recorded that it's like every year it's like the standout is someone that is there on like a free agent invite undrafted and then they don't get signed and then we never hear from them again and they never end up going anywhere um like the i had to pull up my little roster because i forgot who he was Braden sherman he had like four or five goals in that uh five foot nine forward from the victoria royals in the whl Great scrimmage. I don't think we ever see him again just because that's how these things go. A couple years ago, it was Josh Williams, Edmonton Oil Kings, in the WHL. I wrote about him. Like, this guy might be, you know, a good get. He uh, never signed a pro contract. He's playing Canadian university hockey. Before him, it was, I can't even remember the guy's name. I know Dane was big on him. Uh, he was Minnesota State Mankato. I think he was a sophomore at the time. Uh, he 
He went back to school, never signed a pro contract anywhere, not in the minor leagues. He, I looked, I found his LinkedIn when I remembered. Oh, uh, Spooner. I don't remember his first yeah, name. Yeah, Spooner. Yeah. Uh, I found his LinkedIn. He's like a minister somewhere. So, <laughs> great game for Brayden Sherman. Um, I, it just typically doesn't mean anything in the setting. I mean, Poulian had an outstanding game too, but he's also much more experienced than these guys. If anything, that was just encouraging to see that he hasn't really lost a step Mm -hmm. skating wise or anything like that or a shot or you know just those individual things and I'm sure it's good for him confidence wise just after he barely played last year because um he left in December he came back three months later even when he was back in Wilkes-Barre he only played two games to finish the season because he just hadn't been on the ice and he was at home dealing with you know mental health personal um focuses so he only played two games was more just by getting his like conditioning and just his overall game back to where it was but um that was good to see from him uh one of the i don't know unexpected standouts for me amel jarventy um he seems like maybe the gym uh late round gym of this past draft class um they got him in the seventh round, they had two seventh rounders. He was the he was the first um, of the two Finnish kid. He's he's small. Um, that's his thing. What's he listed at? Uh, five foot ten, one hundred and sixty eight pounds. So he uh, the height's average. Um, he needs or slightly below average. He needs to get heavier, but he's also eighteen. Um, but I mean, to get a guy in the seventh round of you know he's super skilled. Uh, we saw that in the scrimmage. He had a he had a goal or two, um, and it, he has pro experience. Last year, he split the year between um, the Liga, that's the top Finnish league, the second f- Finnish league, which is like their it's like the minor league, so still pro, still playing against grown men, and then like the U twenty junior league. Um, so him for him, he's looking to be full time in the in the Liga next year, um, but. He stood out to me, it, I, and we only saw him in the scrimmage because him and um, Callie Kangas, the two seventh rounders, so they obviously weren't in Nashville um, at the at the draft. Because if you're going to go that late, especially if you're coming from Europe, you kind of those kids don't come to the draft. Because if you don't get drafted, then it's just kind of sad. Um, so you know, the draft it was the what twenty eighth, twenty ninth, and then. Free uh, camp starts the first, so very quick turnaround. Uh, they have to fly over from Finland kind of last minute. Their bags get lost, so they didn't. The first two days of camp, they were there, but they were just kind of watching for the bench because they didn't have anything, um, like even their skates, anything like that. So for them to you know jump in the way they did, and Kangas looked fine. Um, don't really mm. have much to say about him, um, but Jarvati stood out and. To go back to Jaeger, because he came, you know, he was in Nashville, obviously, for the draft. Those kids aren't showing up to Nashville with all of their gear because most teams don't have their development camps this soon. Some teams are just starting right. to have theirs. They go back home. Jaeger gets drafted by a team that it's like, hey, you're actually not going home. You're coming straight to Pittsburgh. He only had his skates um, with him. He had brought his skates. So everything he was using was, like, borrowed a- equipment. And you, you wouldn't tell, like, he was bar, he had, like, Lucas Vakovsky's sticks, um, you know, stuff like that. So he's not even using his own sticks, but uh, you couldn't, you definitely couldn't tell I watched it. Yeah, no, no, I, I think that, that was pretty impressive that he, that he stood out the way he did using other people's gear. I mean, it, not to be like, oh, you have to play the game to know, but it, it's different than, like, football or basketball where you can just, you, you got your cleats or your sneakers or whatever and you need a ball. Like, you, you get so accustomed to using particular gear. And while, yes, it's all, you know, loosely the same, there's a lot of like minute details and, and differences in those. And it, it can really throw you off your game. Like I, I tell people all the time, hockey players are skating on the ice pretty much every day. And if you take two, three, four five days off, you get back on the ice, all of a sudden it feels like you've never skated in your life. So you can imagine the, you know, the, the challenges of getting new gloves that are unfamiliar to you and using a stick that might have a different um, angle of the blade, or it's got a different kind of toe curve on it or whatever. There's all these kind of little different things that could really, really impact you in a negative way. But obviously Jaeger didn't let that affect him at all. No, 
Uh, Tristan Bros, so we got to mention, uh, a former second round pick. His freshman year, um, University of Minnesota didn't go so hot. He was just like really slow to get going. His second half, so he was a sophomore last year, but going back two years ago, his freshman year, uh, kind of slow to get going. Anyway, he ended up transferring last summer to the University of Denver. He had just a much better, more consistent year there. He's still seems to be a bit more of a project. I mean, he's definitely a couple of years off from even going mm-hmm. pro. Um, I thought just his skating stood out in that game. He had a couple of goals too. Um, but a second, I, I don't, I mean, a second round pick, they're always going to have flaws. He still seems like a little underwhelming as a second round pick. Um, but I, I thought he looked, he looks a whole lot different this year than he did yeah, last year. I- I did not have a very high opinion of his long-term outlook coming into this camp. And again, I know we just sat here and spent, I don't know, 15 minutes talking about how it doesn't really impact much going forward, but it it definitely stood out. Like you said, his skating looks a little more refined. Um, He seems like he's got maybe a little bit more power and and control in his skating. It, It kind of previously just seemed like it was all over the place and a little bit too sloppy, especially for a guy his size who should be, you know, really leaning on his skating. Um, but he, he just seemed a little more assertive and confident. I don't know if that was because he was familiar with, with going through camp or whatever it was, but I, I left camp feeling a little bit better about him than I did going in. Yeah. You want to talk about power, Luke Devlin? You want to talk about Luke Devlin? So I'm looking, like, I'm, I have my sheets from camp in front of me. So these are, like, I, uh, last year's numbers. I mean, he's Matt, He's 6'3", he's big, and he was listed at 187 last year but i still he looks kind of on the he looked kind of on the smaller side day one at camp you saw him after he got off the ice i'm like that guy got big and other people are saying that too like steige was up there uh during the scrimmage like do you guys see that luke devlin kid yesterday Mm -hmm. uh and i know you're our resident luke devlin beat writer uh talk about luke devlin (laughs) Yeah, I, f- first and foremost, it, he's a great kid. Like, I, I've loved just the interactions I've had with him in the locker room. He seems just very grateful to even have the opportunity to, to be drafted into the NHL and be part of an organization. Um, but that that's a kid who is really hungry to improve and get better and, and actually, you know, make a name for himself. And um, Tom Kostopoulos admitted, like, he, he is still kind of a raw project right now. There's a lot of refinement that he needs. Um, but but you look at, at the the toolbox that he has right now. Obviously, that kind of size and, and strength is coveted for a center because he, he projects if he ever makes it to the NHL, he'd be like a bottom six kind of defensive minded center. Um, but the fact that he's only 19 years old, has this kind of height, already has that weight and the strength to go along with it. He's been training with Gary Roberts and we all know Gary Roberts ain't no joke. Um <laughs> So he's been training with Gary Roberts. He actually told me a a funny story during camp that he was watching the NHL awards and he was like, yeah, I, I watched, I watched McDavid get the heart trophy or whatever. And then, you know, I kind of turned the awards off or whatever. And then I showed up to Gary Roberts training facility the next morning at like six or 7 AM and McDavid was there (laughs) and like McDavid got, got his awards that night, caught a red eye back up uh, to Toronto and, and was back in the gym grinding the next morning. So, uh, I, I think it's great that, you know, Devlin is at least exposed to that and, and sees what it takes uh, from the very best of the best there. But uh, going back to his toolbox, obviously he has, he has the size, the, the strength, the weight to him, but he's a really good skater for how big he is. And there's a lot of power and control there as well. One of the things he talked to me about, he kind of had like a light bulb flick on for him midway through this past season when he was playing in the BCHL. He said that he was going, he was carrying the puck into the zone one on three, didn't really have any other options. He was like, I'm just going to try and throw this on on my backhand, dig my edges into the ice as hard as I can and lean into these defenders. And it ended up working out. He, he took the puck right to the rack in, in power forward fashion and, and ended up scoring a goal. And he said from there, it kind of took his confidence to a new level. And then from there, he started adding new elements and new wrinkles to his game. Um, and he's got a pretty good shot too. I, I don't know that he'll ever be the greatest playmaker in the world, but he's got a pretty good shot as well. So, um, I, I really like 
his potential, obviously being a seventh round pick, he's, he's got a very, very long road ahead. I can't imagine even if he does make the NHL, it probably is three, four years away at least. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of the, of the kid on the ice and off the ice as well. I'm, I'm rooting for him. And, uh, but yeah, uh, of, of an unspectacular group of, you know, not, high names like the Jaegers or Pickerings, I've, I've got to put him, you know, pretty close up in that second tier right now. Yeah, definitely a couple of years ago, like away, like you said. Um, I mean, BCHL the last two years, he's going to Cornell next year. Mm-hmm. Ever hear of it? Um, of the Wilkes-Barre guys who, uh, who, who are there, Ty Glover is one that I'm uh, interested in. I just you know, he was one um, of the. They signed six undrafted f- or unsigned undrafted free agents last year. He was one of them. Uh, he's he's I mean, he's a the kind of a power forward type, and he's big. He already has a size six to three, two hundred one pounds. Uh, he was in and out of the lineup last year in in Wilkes-Barre. He never went down to Wheeling, but he he wasn't. Um, he was a healthy scratch a bit. I mean, he only played let's see, forty nine games. Uh, he, I think there's an injury in the middle there too, but a lot of that was a healthy scratch. But um, he was definitely more of a regular later on in the season. It, yeah, definitely a bottom six floor type. Definitely has the energy um, skating. Uh, it's more just about putting it all together at the, at the pro level. J.D. Forrest would say he was their most improved player um, over the course of the season. So um for him next year i just be i just be looking at him to be a full-time ahl or not necessarily pushing for an nhl uh spot yet and then also while we're on the topic of guys with size uh daniel lotch he was their seventh round pick in 2021 i don't think we've ever talked about him ever um six foot five 183 pounds he's massive i feel like six foot five he's taller than that i talked to him and he's standing up and i'm like i feel like crane my neck the whole time um He's a stay-at-home defensive defenseman. And I feel like the pool just doesn't have a lot of those. Like, the prospect pool doesn't have a lot of stay-at-home, steady defensive defensemen. He's um, he's in college. He was a sophomore last year at University of Wisconsin. Um, so he's probably still, like, a year or two off from even going pro if the Penguins do um, choose to sign him. But I, I just feel like they don't have very many guys with his skill set. Um, and I feel like he moves well for a guy with his size. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a heavy shot. He doesn't score like ever, <laughs> only in these scrimmages. Like in his last two years, he has a goal in each of those seasons. It's just not what he what he does. But then this year he had a nice goal. Last year he had two in the scrimmage. No, 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 no. <laughs> not it's it's not just he. Last year he scored. I, I'm a sucker for snipes from distance in hockey like uh, there's nothing about the sport i love more than a good old top corner just blistering shot from above the circles last year lotch had the most ridiculous shot from distance where and and he's not like a dude who's got like a ton of uh, puck skills or anything like that he crossed the offensive blue line kind of cut toward the middle and in the same motion just whipped the puck on goal in the most like vicious violent manner I'd ever seen someone shoot the puck and it went far down faster than any shot I'd ever seen in my life. It was crazy. So I, we've never talked about this guy, but I just had to get that out there. This wasn't just, Oh yeah, he scored a couple last year. It was a ridiculous goal. But then you look at what he does when he's actually playing and it's like, ah, okay. Yeah, well, because I, I talked to him and, like, he's talking. I don't know. I, I have a feature coming on him. But, like, I, you know, he's someone having you no know, offense, you know, not maybe something he'd like to add, but it's not really his game. And I'm like, how come you score? You're like crazy. <laughs> he's like, I don't know. He's like, I don't know. I guess there's the right place at the right time here every year. Um, I, we, I, we have a bunch of features on these guys coming. I talked to a bunch. You talked to a bunch. Um, they're even though developing game server, we're still running them. I, I already ran uh Poulin, Pickering. Um, I have we've talked about most of the guys that have coming. Chase Yoder is another one. Chase Yoder, um, he's he was a he was a junior at Providence College this past year. He's definitely like Teddy Bluger the second, like coming. Um, that's just his game. Um, just the defensive. Uh, abilities he has then the face-off numbers especially too he was putting up crazy face-off numbers uh in providence he kind of looks like teddy bluger in the face kind of crazy 
Um, he did when I talked to him. He said Teddy Bluger is like the kind of player that he can see himself being at this level. We don't need to go down the full roster because, like I said, we have a bunch of these features coming. Anyone else you want to touch on? Um, not off the top of my head. No. I mean, Cali <laughs> Kang is just phenomenal name. Phenomenal. <laughs> Best, uh, best name. Yeah, he was the, the he was the next to last pick in the whole draft. The um, the other Finn they took who wasn't on the ice the first two days. Cali Kangas, uh, defenseman, six foot four, two hundred five pounds. So uh, another massive, massive guy. His skating needs work. It didn't look. I mean, we only saw him one day, um, so it's hard to really say. It didn't look, I guess, as bad as I thought it would be based on just what we heard about him or read about him. Um, he's he's a long ways off. He's you know a lot of times you draft the guys out of you know Finland at this age. Maybe they have a little bit of pro experience. If it's not Liga, maybe it's the second league. He doesn't have any. He's only played junior uh, hockey. So um, I mean he has to crack the pro level over there first before he even thinks about coming over here. Uh, he he. So we got we we talked to him in Jarvanti day two. Um, a couple of people had requested them. Uh, the way they did it, so apparently Kangas just like really doesn't speak English that well. Jarvinty's English is pretty good, so they brought them both out, and we got to talk to Jarvinty, like, and then we talked to K- Kangas like through Jarvinty. So Kangas, he could definitely understand more than he could speak. So like we would say it. Sometimes you try to answer it by himself. Sometimes he'd have to translate through Jarvinty. So Jarvinty, a great translator, but mm-hmm. um. I mean, the when we got the scouting report on Kangas at the draft, um, Nick Pryor, in his you know when he was telling us about him, he said hard to play against three times, um, and so that's I mean that's the kind of player he is. But um, someone asked Kangas like, they say you're hard to play against. Do you think you're hard to play against? And he didn't understand that. Jarvin he translated it, and then he's like, oh. Yes. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Hubbard>. yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's him. Like I said, we'll have more uh, features coming over the next few days. We have a couple up. I know you have Cooper Foster up on the site right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so a uh, lot coming. And then uh, rookie camp. And the, we get a lot of prospect stuff coming this summer. My favorite time of year. We spent way too much time talking about Cali Kangas and those kind of guys. But. <laughs> Uh, thanks again for, uh, joining us. We appreciate you joining us all throughout, uh, the season over the last year, listening to us every Saturday. We hope you, uh, stay tuned to the stuff we have coming on, uh, DK Pittsburgh Sports. And thanks again for listening.